Okay, um, let's start. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for uh, this talk. Today we are hosting uh, Nick. Uh, he's an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Vermont, uh, and he directs the uh, UVM uh, Neuro Robotics Lab there. Uh, their focus is on uh, creating more flexible, scalable, and context of a robot and decision-making systems through a variety of uh, techniques. Um, and uh, in addition to um, um, their embodied AI works, they also uh, focus on uh, using machine learning to accelerate science for a common good like medicine and agri agriculture and environmental sciences. So if that's okay with you, Nick, I would uh, like to ask you about what is the um, what is one of the uh, common good projects that you're currently involved in? Yeah, thanks. Great question. I, I wish I could give a whole talk on that as well. Um, it's it's really fun, uh, you know, in the auto ML space to be thinking about data science as a real practical uh, output of, of the machine learning systems we're building and to be able to work with some real data and do things like think about bias in medicine or automating diagnosis with wearable sensors or you know reducing pesticide emission that sort of stuff is it's uh, you know really rewarding to have a, an impact here and now uh, especially as, as you'll hear a lot of my work in embodied AI is kind of pretty theoretical um, so it's a fun balance and variety for me. Cool thank you so much and uh, so before we start just a couple of communication rules um, uh, I will, um, after we're done, I, I will mute everyone. Um, and uh, you can just raise your hand using the Zoom raise uh, hand button if you want to uh, ask any questions during the talk. So uh, Nick, do you prefer everybody to wait until the end of the talk or if it, is it okay with you if they ask their questions as it comes? Yeah, I'll try to leave time at the end too, but if there's any pressing questions, feel free to interrupt as we go too. Great. So after you raise your hand, I will unmute you and you can ask your question and at the end we'll have an open discussion. Um, with that said, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and yes. Okay, great. And just for the information, um, this um, uh, talk is recorded and will be later posted on our um, uh, YouTube channel. Thank you, Nick. Great. And you can hear me and see me all right? Yes, perfect. Perfect. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for coming. Um, thanks for the introduction and, and just for hosting this, um, this seminar series. I think it's, it's really great to have such a focus on embodied AI. Um, as mentioned, I'm going to talk today about brain body co optimization of uh, embodied machines. Um, and some of the work we're doing at, at UVM. So uh, like many of us here, I think, uh, I have the perspective of being interested in intelligence um, and, and both fundamental understanding and, and engineering of it. Um, and I think that this is the, the picture we all hold is the, the pinnacle of intelligence is you know, human level AI. And we even use that term human level AI as kind of the, the, the thing to shoot for in artificial intelligence. Um, and I want to give a slightly different perspective today. So I've, I framed this talk around um, some of the, the lessons learned or perspectives that I want to share from working in the embodied AI space. And, and the first one isn't really a, a result I want to share, but more of a, of a preface uh, of how I think about this problem. And it's that, you know, we humans are, are not actually so special. Um, so, so much of the work in AI is, is based off of humanoid robots and it, it makes sense that, you know, where are these amazing thinking machines um, and, and can do, do so much in the world around us. Uh, but, but sometimes the emphasis on human level AI, I think, distracts from all of the other work in embodied AI that maybe is not quite so fragile um, and, and can lead us to questions about scalability and, scalability and robustness and the things that we care about in our embodied systems. Um, and so I think that, that one uh, great example of this, or, or many great examples of this, um, are the, the animals um, like this parkour dog um, that, that interact so seamlessly and, and effortlessly with the world around us. Um, and this is just one example of the, the myriad of, of animals and creatures that we could take inspiration from. And, and this is kind of the perspective I'll take to 
uh, engineering AI is, is to think not just about human intelligence, but how we can take lessons th throughout the animal kingdom uh, in, in how things come to be uh, intelligent and interact with the world around them in a really seamless way. And in this uh, talk, given the, the context, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, the, the body, the shape, and the form of animals and how their, their physical interactions are formed. But I just want to say really quickly that, that this, I don't think, is a perspective that's unique to physical intelligence. Um, but, it, but it's also very much a, a lesson I would apply to studying the brain as well. Uh, one of my uh, mentors in, in grad school, Park Finlay, put out this fantastic paper uh, looking at the relative brain size of different mammals. Um, and even though humans are at the end of the spectrum as animals with, you know, very large brains and, uh, you know, very large neocortex, for example, uh, the, the, the organization and structure and, and thus I would uh, um, assume function um, or at least the rules that govern the regulation and growth and development of these structures it is very consistent throughout the, the other 130 uh, mammal species that, that she analyzed in this paper. Um, and so is this just to say that taking the animal level intelligence approach to AI, I don't think is at odds with human level intelligence. Um, and it's something that, that we should consider kind of despite the goals. And, and this is a philosophy that I think is shared by a lot of folks in, in the ALIF community. Um, and one of the uh, kind of fundamental assumptions that I'll bring into the, the rest of this talk is on methodology. So I think that a lot of the ideas and lessons that I'll, I'll draw from this work uh, can be applied to a, a variety of different techniques. But for most of what I will talk about today, um, we're going to be using evolutionary algorithms and trying to evolve intelligent behavior. Um, through uh, because of the, the bio inspiration, uh, but also because this is a really nice black box system um, where, where we can take things that are difficult to differentiate through like uh, the body plans of robots um, and, and use this sampling technique uh, to try to approximate the gradients to let us do hill climbing in these, these spaces that at least historically have been really hard to, to do uh, gradient descent on. So uh, despite the fact that I'm sure as individuals, each of you are very unique snowflakes, uh, the, the first point here is that, that we humans are not special and that we should think about animal level intelligence and, and implied by that is kind of evolutionary histories and, and developmental patterns and, and the commonalities that, that shape what intelligent behavior looks like um, th throughout uh, the different types of creatures that interact with the world. So the, the maybe first big chunk of meat in this talk uh, is, is what's implied by looking at the way that animals interact with the world. Um, and that's the computation is not just something that, that happens in the brain. And, and the idea that, that we're going to come back to here is, is morphological computation. So uh, we, we're probably in this room uh, all familiar with the, the idea of embodied intelligence. Um, and it is a framework that we lean on quite a bit in, in our work. Uh, which is that the, the body modulates the interactions of our brain with the outside environment. Um, and, and kind of a, a simple uh, shallow view of this is that the, the type of input streams that we get and the way that, that our uh, brain can affect the outside environment is, is modulated through this interface, which is our body. And, and it shapes uh, the, the, the way that we see the world around us. Now, morphological computation takes an even deeper approach to that and says that it's, it's not just that the body is affecting the way that the brain thinks, but it's actually offloading uh, and, and doing some of the thinking that, that the brain would, would need to do. And by this, I mean, it's, it's making the job of the brain easier and simpler and uh, literally requiring it to do less computation because computation is absorbed by uh, some implicit function in the morphology. So my favorite example of this is the, the very extreme where think of a robot that has absolutely no brain at all, no control system, this passive walker uh, just uses the interactions of, of gravity um, and its embodiment with the physical world around it. And so the, the fact that it has uh, joints that are in just the right place and limbs that are just the right length and, and is really nicely finely tuned uh, to interact with this decline slope and with gravity means that it does these behaviors which look really complex and organic and, and maybe even more natural than the, the fancy uh, robots we saw in the opening slides. Um, and yet it does so with, with absolutely no control on top of it. 
Um, and so, so that's an example of the, the morphology uh, simplifying, simplifying all the way to zero, the, the control that's required um, by the robot. And uh, you know, just, despite how natural an idea this seems, it's, it's uh, at odds with a lot of the work in humanoid robots and, and, um, and industrial robots in general. We rely a lot on inverse kinematics and trying to figure out you know, exactly where each of our limbs or actuators uh, should be in space and time. Um, and, and that is something that just requires a lot of compute and, and is a really difficult thing to do. And looking at the behavior of what comes out of this, it turns out to be a, a really unnatural way of solving this problem. Um, and so the, the philosophy and approach that, that we have is that looking at uh, you know, animal type intelligence and animal level intelligence and trying to design robots that have similar features, uh, we can design uh, well, high performing morphologies uh, that, that absorb a lot of that computation and, and simplify the task um, to something that seems as effortless as effortless as, as you and I think about walking. That you know, just the fact that uh, you know our our hips and knees swing the way that they do, and our, our legs are the right length, means that we can do this controlled fall called walking without having to think about you know where to place each of our 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 feet or how to articulate each of our uh, our joints as we go. Uh, into this really seamless uh, low compute paradigm. And this is an idea that um, I think uh, applies throughout the brain uh, that, that we can have these tricks that offload computation that, you know, uh, thinking more, um, more about processing in the brain, you wouldn't imagine that we're solving inverse kinematics every time we see some physical object move in the real world, but we have these folk physics, naive physics intuitions. And, and this is kind of the analogy for that of, of what's happening within the body. Uh, another great uh, uh, domain to explore these ideas, I think, is manipulation. Um, that here's a, a really complex uh, articulated hand, and if you were to think of, you know, an open loop controller that would articulate all of these dozens of degrees of freedom into uh, some behavioral pattern that would, you know, uh, hold but not crush this light bulb, it would be incredibly uh, difficult and, and computationally in intensive to think about exactly what the right um, grip would be. And I, I was actually so happy to see uh, Shrang Song uh, give a talk uh, a few weeks ago here because she beautifully introduced this idea, even if uh, under different names, um, that morphological computation could happen uh, through the optimization of, of uh, high performing form and shape in, in a gripper. Um, that we've taken this, this articulated hand, which might have dozens of degrees of freedom before, and it's now simplified into a, a single one degree of freedom system where it's just open or close. And all of the complexity of trying to grasp this uh, oddly shaped object is now moved into the optimization of uh, the, the shape and form of, of these claws on the gripper. Um, and, and so this is a, a perfect example of uh, the, the idea behind morphological computation, which is that with the right body, control is simple. Um, and, and that's something we'll, we'll uh, rely a lot on it and, and come back to throughout this work. Uh, this, this idea um, has been taken even a step further by the field of, of soft robotics, um, which, which I really love, uh, that, that says, uh, you know, it's, it's great to have, um, you know, grippers that conform to uh, a given object, but it's it's really hard to think about creating a, a different topology, like we saw in the last slide, for every single object. And in fact, having material properties interact with these shape properties is a really important part of um, of robustness and scalability here, where we can have this, uh, for example, the granular jamming gripper on the top that uh, conforms around some shape um, just through soft uh, interactions of, of the physics and in the object and conforms to exactly the, the shape that it needs. And then it's one degree of freedom. It's just to stiffen up. Uh, in this case, it, it vacuums out the, uh, the, the air that allows this, uh, this glove or, or balloon to move. Um, it informs exactly around the, the shape that we need. And so here is a great example of, um, of kind of design for free through material properties. Um, and, and this, uh, I, I love this example from uh, manipulation, but we'll talk mostly about locomotion today. And, and you see in the bottom that um, these soft robots are uh, incredibly more robust um, to, to uneven ground and, and different environments um, through, through their material properties. 
So uh, we want soft materials that can interact with the world around them. We want to be able to design uh, complex shapes that, that interact with the objects that they're, they're dealing with. Um, I was really lucky at, in grad school to come after a, a phenomenal um, engineer and, and researcher, uh, John Hiller, who built this um, articulated soft voxel simulation um, that, that let us uh, combine material properties with, with the, the design of shapes of soft creatures um, or, or soft uh, uh, structures. Uh, and uh, I came into this asking, okay, we have all of these uh, soft voxel cells interacting. How can we arrange them in a way uh, that, that looks like and feels like and, and behaves and performs like the complexity of, of animals that, that we see around us in, in their behavior? Uh, so for this, we turn to uh, one of my collaborators and, and great friends, uh, Ken Stanley, um, and his phenomenal work on, on compositional pattern producing networks. Uh, so if you're not familiar with these, uh, the idea here is that we have a, a neural network that takes in uh, the coordinates of a, of a given pixel and outputs some material property of that pixel. And, and this network is strided over some image much the way that a convolutional filter is. Um, and by inputting the, the pixels in this space, the, the coordinates of the pixels, um, what we do is we uh, enable it to create these very regular patterns. So for example, the, the trivial network X creates a, a horizontal gradient in this space. Uh, but one of the interesting things about these networks is that they have non-sigmoidal activation functions. Uh, so for example, putting in a, a Gaussian activation function gives us left-right symmetry. Um, when applied to the X input, applying a sinusoidal activation function to the Y input gives us uh, vertical repetition. And uh, pretty quickly with these sparse networks, we're getting patterns that look fairly regular and, and organic and complex, um, which is, is really cool. As someone uh, deeply interested in, in evolutionary biology and, and developmental biology, uh, I'm really excited by the fact that if you, you squint just hard enough, um, these patterns that, that are composed on top of each other within the network uh, start to look a lot like the composition of morphogens in early embryogenesis, um, where these patterns are, are laid on top of each other and interact with each other uh, to determine in, in really interesting nonlinear ways the, the cell fate of, um, of embryos, which, which we know leads to complex and, and differentiated body forms um, in, in bi biological development. Uh, as a, a nerdy mathematician, the, the other thing that I'm, I'm really excited about about these networks and, and the way that they sparsely represent the, the high level features of this space is that um, what you see here are, uh, are, are patterns that differ just by one you know, uh, modification of an of a edge or a weight in, in that network. Um, and so by having these minimal mutations in the, the genetic network space, um, we're able to uh, change perhaps very drastically the, the pixel space that we're working in while retaining these high level features uh, without having to, um, to prescribe what the, that feature space is that we're working on. So as, as, as we all know, a really important part of optimization, being able to make these, these big jumps that, uh, that um, maintain a lot of the, the structure um, and, and high level features of the system that we're interested in. I could give a, a whole hour long talk just on this slide, uh, but this is, is something that was really inspirational for me that, that Ken and his group uh, had the, the brilliant idea uh, based off of some early work from another one of my heroes, Carl Sims, uh, to hook up these uh, pattern producing networks to an interactive system um, where they would compete over the, the scarce resource of people's time and attention and clicks. Um, and so uh, just through applying an evolutionary process to, to these networks, um, they found that the things that grabbed people's attention were really organic forms um, and, and really complex and, um, and sometimes kind of scary forms. Um, and, and not only is this amazing computer generated art, um, but, but I think also gave me a lot of inspiration that we could create complex robotic forms, applying these same ideas to, to 3D and, and soft robots. So that's exactly what we did. Um, we set out to, to optimize the two things I said we care about before, which is the, the structure of, um, of our robot and also the material properties. Um, and so uh, in, in the system, we have um, two uh, passive 
uh, soft materials, um, one that's extremely soft, like a, a tissue or, or tendon, one that's a little, little bit more hard, uh, has structure like a bone, um, and then these two opposing muscle groups. So it was the, the simplest um, control system we could think of in the spirit of, our, of a, you know, the passive blocking robot, where we're trying to ask uh, just how complex behavior can we get just out of the morphology of these robots without, without any um, control complexity on top of this. Um, and so the, the things that, that Sorry, come out of this I, robot. Can I ask a question? Why, why do you need uh, two muscle groups? Yeah, good question. Um, it turns out to make the behavior uh, a little bit more interesting. Um, putting opposing muscle groups next to each other can let you articulate limbs in, in a way that's similar to how we uh, do so in, in, in our bodies. Uh, we tried a whole bunch of other permutations and uh, it turned out that two was a lot more complex than one, but adding three or four or five turned out not to be all that, all that different. So this was the the simplest system that we thought had interesting behaviors. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so, so out of this system, just hooking it up to an evolutionary algorithm, we asked it to create uh, as fast robots as, as it possibly could. And it came up with this, um, the, this myriad of, of really interesting forms. And I've watched this video so many times, but still smile every time seeing these. Uh, just the, the creativity and, and effectiveness of all of these solutions um, was just, you know, so fun for me to, to show up each morning and, and kind of just uh, as a naive observer figure out um, what, what uh, this evolutionary loop would come up with. Um, and, and what's amazing about this is that we don't pre-specify anything about what high-performing animals or robots look like or any um, laws of physics that, that would be helpful or any strategies, but evolution starts from this, you know, cube of jello and realizes that if you make it asymmetric, it'll hop a little bit in one direction. And, and that if you carve out the middle, you can make front and back limbs. And that, uh, yeah, if, if you take these two muscle groups and put them right next to each other, you can have fast actuation back and forth. Um, that, that bilateral symmetry turns out to be important for, for running in a straight line or not. Um, and, and by the end of this, this system, uh, you know, with totally no input from us, uh, we have what seems like these really graceful and, and um, empirically effective robots. Uh, Quick question. So the, the, hard, the hard bones are inside the, I mean, all of them had hard bones. We just couldn't you, see them necessarily. Yeah, you see some on the, on the outside here, like this, you know, really odd flailing robot that, that I, I never would have thought of designing, you know, a robot with no legs that flails its arms. And, and this one doesn't have any hard bones. So it, it's totally up to the, the evolutionary system to, to build them or not. Like this weird slinky robot is, is taking advantage of the fact that it's soft throughout, um, where, where this one has a, you know, kind of like a backbone that it's uh, actuating off of. Um, so it, is, we don't specify anything about where bones have to be inside of a creature. This is a you know, totally hands-off, um, an, an automated process that comes up with weird, crazy things that just happen to be effective, like a, a donkey headstand. Uh, this is very interesting. So did you see that, does it, the network, did it really have to uh, have any, like the evolutionary uh, algorithm? Did it come up with any bones? Was it necessary for the performance? Because um, it might, I, I'm, I don't have any intuition on whether it has to be there in order to perform the task or not. Yeah, it, it depends a lot on the exact nature of the task, our environmental setup, our, um, our, our exact fitness function, whether we're uh, also including other constraints like energetic constraints on the system. And, and you can see that, for example, this one here, um, has a really upright stance with longer legs. And it turns out that being stiff is really helpful for getting you upright and farther away from the ground. And so that's, that's a case where it's really helpful, where, where this one, it has a little bit of bone, but it's not really using it. It's, it's kind of a larger, chunkier, um, more slug-like form. And, and there's you know, not much uh, behavior that comes out of the, the stiffness in, in that case. Um, so it, it varies quite a bit, um, but it, but it I, I was surprised too by how underutilized the, the bone was in developing these. And I think that had partly to do with the parameters of our physics simulation as well. Interesting. So th thinking about how we create complex forms um, and, and especially that these come out of the interaction of our system with the outside environment. 
Um, we looked around for some interesting uh, animal behaviors and, and were really inspired by the, the way the octopus folds itself up and, and squeezes out of a, a tight opening um, and, and tried to uh, put our soft robots in a, in a cage to see if they could come up with the same thing. And, and sure enough, they come up with this really interesting strategy of you know, cutting themselves into thin sheets that are, are flexible enough to fold up and, and fit out of this narrow opening. Uh, we, we tried other environmental um, uh, situations like putting these things underwater, uh, which, which led to some really fun swimming behavior. Um, and at any time you're you know, working with uh, things in, in water and in land as a, someone interested in evolutionary biology, you have to take the things that are evolved in water and put them on land to see what happens. Um, and sure enough, you know, the, the tentacles of the squid turn into proto legs. Um, but, but interestingly, if you go the other way around and, and you assume life starts on, on land and then goes into the water, you start with these big, chunky, you know, elephant rhino like, uh, like robots that, uh, that do become a bit leaner when they go in, in the water, but this is, you know, a much more muscular looking squid than you saw before. Um, and, and the behaviors that you see are, are very different than that walking is, you know, nothing like this jellyfish like um, swimming that we see at the end. Um, or, or that, you know, legs uh, can, can turn into to wings underwater. Um, so this is kind of more fun anecdotes than anything else, but, uh, but interesting behaviors, I think, to, to see nonetheless. Um, I, I could show fun videos all day, uh, but let me just, just give one more example, because I think it relates to the ideas of, of morphological computation here, and that's that we, um, we add some uh, ability for control back into these systems. So, um, it, it turns out that some types of, of cells, and especially our, our cardiac cells in our heart, um, have uh, gap junctions and, and do action potentials much the way that, that neurons do. Um, and so building in these, you know, uh, muscular spiking cells into our evolutionary systems and letting them choose uh, where to have um, electrical activity or where not to, we can, you know, perhaps come up with interesting circuits that allow us to, um, to to physically uh, send uh, information through through the system. Um, it turns out that the, the control that's needed here is, is really simple and we don't get a lot of the, the hardwired um, uh, computation. It, actually, the, the um, propagation of, of these action potential waves, uh, much like in the heart where, where these are just simple linear waves and actually it's, it's really bad for you if you, you have them interacting in nonlinear ways, um, turn out to be really great for stepping um, or for, for slithering um, and, and lead to, to some fun and, and interesting behaviors. So I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, talk about the, the idea that in embodied cognition and, and embodied intelligence, we think about the real world as its best simulator. Um, and, and there's so many questions about how the, the things that uh, make for fun videos, um, if you put them to techno music, um, could, could relate to actual things in the real world. Um, and uh, and uh, for, for the sake of time, uh, and because I can, I'm going to completely punt on that question um, and, and just tease that, that my uh, great friend and, and longtime collaborator, Josh Bongar, is going to be coming in a few sessions. And I would highly recommend his, uh, his talks. He's going to talk a lot about how he's uh, adopted this system um, and, and partnered with folks to, to think about how to cross the simulation to reality gap. Uh, this is a, a great paper uh, where they created the, the Xenobots, which was uh, actually manufacturing the, the soft robots out of frog cells um, to create living uh, creatures or, or robots or however you want to uh, define them. Um, it was a, a great paper and, and actually won the um, Corazelli Prize for the, the top paper in, in PNA, or one of the top papers in PNAS this year. Um, with the, the fantastic Mike Levin at Tufts, who actually runs a, an Allen Discovery Center over there too. Um, he's, he's done some work with uh, Rebecca Kramer Boltogio at, at Yale, um, going way beyond the work I've done in, in trying to 3D print these robots um, and, and analyzing their, um, their behavior and, and how they cross the reality gap. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to leave this as a teaser for his talk to say it's, it's going to be really fantastic. So I, I hope you, uh, you listen into that one as well. Uh, before we leave morphological computation, let me just uh, uh, pitch one more idea here. 
uh, which is uh, taking the actuation and uh, rather than being quite so inspired by animals, more inspired by plants where we have these slow growing processes towards some light source. Um, and the way that we, uh, we, we set up this problem uh, is by giving uh, evolution, in this case, just two types of, of tissues, one that always grows and one that always shrinks, and we ask it to, to grow towards some light source. Um, now, the, the best way to reach the target, the, the way to grow as far as you can, is to have all growing muscles. Um, and, and that lets you take all of your capacity and, and use it to, to reach out to your sides. And, and it turns out that uh, being able to do this relies a lot on, on your embodiment and how uh, the, the structure and, and rigidness and, and compliance of the robot's body here interacts with gravity to be able to point exactly towards these light sources and, and not have to worry about actively uh, controlling them, but just taking all of its capacity and using them to, to grow as much as it can, which seems kind of like a trivial uh, solution until you uh, ask what would happen if you did this with stiff materials that weren't able to have that passive interaction with, with gravity and physics. And it turns out that they need to do active actuation, that they need to put these opposing muscle groups together where a shrinking muscle next to a growing muscle uh, creates curvature that lets you do the pointing. Um, and so they're, they're able to, in a more controlled, more, um, more articulated way, um, do the same pointing out to the sides, but it, it turns out that they're not able to reach as far. Um, and, and this is actually one of the, the few examples I, I think I've seen where we're trying to put a, a quantitative number on morphological computation. And it's, it's still very hand wavy, I'll, I'll admit, but um, if you assume that you need uh, soft tissue here, not for, for growing and reaching, but for actively actuating towards your target, um, the, in, in the case where we have softer materials, we need far less of that uh, shrinking tissue and we can, we can get away with far more of the, the, the growing one that lets us reach further. So uh, here's uh, you know, a, a really simple um, quantitative plot showing that you know, we, we have uh, potentially more morphological computation when we have more complex and compliant materials. Um, and I, I uh, you know, I'm really interested in, in applying this further into more complex uh, morphological computation measures of, of shape and, and material interactions. So uh, hopefully this section, um, I, I've uh, got you to come around to the idea, if, if you haven't already, that the computation is not just something that happens in the brain, but that uh, having uh, well-designed body plans lets you do complex things and interact, interact with the world around you and that uh, there actually is morphological computation happening, that, that with the right morphology, uh, control is simple. So we have a way to create these complex body plans that, that even by themselves can create uh, interesting behaviors. And, and we know, you know, we have lots of tools that will let us create complex controllers and policies. Let's put these two things together and, and make, you know, these super robots um, that, that can do incredibly lifelike and, and complex behaviors. Um, to, to do this, uh, we are going to uh, actually use a, a distributed control paradigm um, to fit into our compositional pattern producing framework and, and actually let us do some of our control experiments a little bit more easily. Um, but I would say that uh, even though we're making CPG controllers, uh, central pattern generators, or, or little neural networks within each of these voxels, uh, the same thing would apply if you thought of having a centralized controller. And in fact, all of the, the artifacts and, and ideas that I'm going to talk about would be much more extreme, I would think, with a centralized controller like you normally see in, in robotics. And so, uh, yeah, let's, let's do it. We set out, uh, put all of these uh, soft robots uh, doing their thing on the supercomputer, uh, come back the, the, the next day to see um, how, how these things have, have developed. And much to my dismay and frustration and, and confusion, uh, we, we don't get any of the complexity and interesting behavior that, that I hoped for. Uh, we, just have the, the same simple shapes and blocks that, that we did when we started things out. And, and this was, was a, a real point of confusion to me. And, and I, I looked everywhere for instances of this. And it's, you know, when we don't publish negative results, it's really hard to find instances of the ways that things can break. 
Um, but uh, just relying on my social network, talking with, with my advisor, uh, Pod, who built one of the, the first physical embodied robots um, with these evolutionary methods, or, or one of my colleagues, um, Nikal, who, who had been uh, designing similar cellular robots, um, they, they, they turned out to be having the, the same exact issues I had. Um, and this, this turned out to be plaguing uh, a lot of the field, actually, that uh, you would uh, run these on a supercomputer for a long time and, and hope to get really complex uh, shapes and behaviors. But it turns out that really early on in, in these long runs, we would be converging to uh, some behavior that, that was you know, all, all right, but uh, certainly not the, the explosion of complexity we were hoping for. And I uh, tried to uh, articulate this in a plot here where each of the, the colors is a unique morphology, a, a unique body plan. And so you see in the first you know, 10 or, or 50 or 100 generations or, or epochs at the very left of the, the graph, um, we see lots of new colors emerging and, and they're climbing up the y-axis as they get, get faster and can move farther. Um, but, but very quickly in this process, we, we converge to just a small handful of, of different body plans um, that, uh, that, that stick around forever and, and really don't, um, don't get much, much better over time. We have these horizontal lines of color. Um, and it's not for lack of trying. There, there are lots of new morphologies that, that come about and are proposed by the system, but they end up uh, falling at, at these lower um, loss or, or fitness levels um, and, and end up being thrown away because they, they appear to not be uh, very promising um, robots. So the, after head scratching for quite a while, the, the uh, framing to think about this um, came from, from taking the, the idea of uh, looking at, at robot uh, behaviors and interactions over time, not as, you know, these uh, agent environment systems, but, but taking a more embodied cognition approach uh, and, and really thinking about the brain body environment systems. And, and that if we think about the body as the thing that affects the way that the brain interacts with the environment or, or that modulates the way um, that sensory information comes to the brain, um, it becomes really clear that uh, the, the brain is, is highly dependent on the body, that uh, it, it, can't, um, it, it can't interact with the world uh, with, with any other body than the one that it's designed for. The, these two things are, are so tightly coupled together that when you try and change to a new morphology uh, as, as one of your, your mutations or, or uh, pseudo gradient steps here, uh, what it ends up doing is it ends up scrambling the inputs and outputs to the brain and, and the behavior that it produces makes absolutely no sense in, in the new body plan. And, and this, uh, this seems like such a, a simple idea, uh, but throughout the, the history of the field of evolutionary robotics and, and thinking about this problem, we, we've taken the, the same approach um, where we have some uh, high-performing uh, robot in, in the color green here. And, and if we try a new morphology, then it's, you know, it's, it's broken this fragile coupling. And so it, it does worse that, you know, you're, uh, think of a, a teenager that's just gone through a, a growth spurt and is now, you know, lanky and awkward and, and tripping on themselves. Um, and, and that it's easy to say that, oh, you've, you've made a bad change. That, that wasn't something you should do. That was a, a bad step in a search space. Try something else instead. Um, and, and so, uh, so we, in, in what we've, we've come up with is, is that instead of just thinking about this as a, a single dimensional um, optimization problem, trying to increase fitness or, or speed over time, um, we also we came up with the idea of adding in a, a second dimension, which is, is uh, optimization time. And so we're, we're comparing things that, um, that have the same amount of fine tuning between the brain and the body, that the, the coupling between these two is, is accounted for such that this new robot, even though it performs much worse than the other, it, it has had less time to build that coupling together. And so we say it's okay if it performs less, we're gonna give it some protected time to figure out how to use its new body. And as it uh, readapts and, and fine tunes the controller to this, this new morphology. Um, we see that, you know, the, the longer legs turn out to allow you to, to run faster. And, and this new morphology it actually is a good one and, and quickly outpaces its, its predecessor. Uh, Ian, I, I think I saw a hand up from you. 
Yeah. What is the minimal step size between two morphologies? Do you change a single voxel, duplicate them? Yeah, great question. Um, that's that's hidden in the, the details of the paper. Um, so the, the, the real answer is I don't have a good idea of what uh, constitutes a, a good step between uh, robots. And, and thinking about uh, how many voxels are different is a, a really naive way to think about this, just like uh, thinking about pixel differences between two images is, is not a, a good way to tell if the content of the, the two are different or not. Um, but it was the best that we had at the time. Um, and so I've made an arbitrary cutoff that says that uh, you, can, uh, you can have robots uh, that have as little as one voxel different, but we don't consider them to be different morphologies unless at least 10% of the voxels changed. Yeah, re really nice uh, in the weeds question. I, I, I love that. Um, so yeah, so, so we have these, these new morphologies coming up and, and uh, outpacing one another as, as these innovations avalanche on, on each other. Um, and the, the really fortunate part of this is that this is you know, not just a conceptual cartoon, but is actually real data from, uh, from the, the, the runs that, that we had um, going with, with this new uh, approach of, of protecting the new morphological innovations with, with some time to readapt and fine tune their controllers. Um, and so we've taken what is, you know, the same exact uh, initial conditions as, as this plot before. We had these rainbow sprinkles of, of failed morphologies down here and, and turned into what we like to call rainbow waterfalls of, of just this, uh, you know, continual uh, growth throughout uh, what turns out to be, you know, many days of supercomputer time um, as, as we continually turn over and find newer and, and better morphologies. Uh, and, and what's, uh, I, I think, maybe most uh, exciting about this uh, isn't just the fact that the, the, the fitness values, the speeds of the robot go up, um, as you can see by the, the color uh, we put the robots in here. But the, with the traditional methods, um, what you end up with is, is kind of like the story we told, where you very quickly converge onto uh, a, a morphology that's pretty close to your initial starting conditions. Um, and, and as soon as you make that uh, controller body plan coupling, you've, you've locked in and, and prematurely converged into, uh, into some body plan. And occasionally you'll get lucky and it'll be a decent one, but for the most part, they end up being uh, pretty terrible. With our, our new approach of adding in this second optimization dimension for uh, fine tuning time, uh, we're able to not only find robots that, that on average are, are much higher performing, uh, but, but do this funny thing that, that as an optimization person, I, I love we're, we're able to escape all of these local optima in this highly multimodal landscape of robot morphologies and, and converge to the same high performing uh, solution across many different runs from, from many different uh, initial conditions, um, which uh, at least gives me some confidence that, that we're uh, on the right track in terms of being able to find complex morphology controller couplings. Um, so uh, the, the idea from, from this section was that the body planes and their controllers are, are coupled together in these, in these highly, um, highly coupled dynamic systems. And, and we have to think about the, fr the fragility of those systems as we're trying to do co-optimization of, of body plans and, and controllers. The, the fragility of, of body plans and controllers um, leads us to the last main point I want to make, which is that uh, you know, robustness has a lot to do with adaptability and, and plasticity. Um, and there's uh, so many fun um, projects in, in this uh, space that I, I wish I had time to show you, but I'll, I'll just show you one that I think is, is really interesting, again, from an optimization perspective, um, where, where I draw my inspiration, um, which is that the, the adaptability uh, of, of these body plans and these robots interact at, at across multiple time scales in, in really interesting ways. Um, and so we, we've talked before about the, the evolutionary time at the bottom, uh, phylogenetic optimization. We've talked about the, the actuation that happens during these robots' lifetimes, uh, the, the here and now. Uh, but let's introduce in a, a third time scale, which is the ontogenetic time, the, the development and growth um, over your lifetimes trying to get into to the idea of, of real lifelong learning machines. Um, 
and we uh, instantiate this in our, our soft robots. Um, uh, some, some of the future work I won't share does this in a, a really interesting closed loop way where depending on the stress and strain at each individual voxel, we'll be optimizing developmental rules that will you know, strengthen some of the muscles or stiffen some of the bones or soften some of the tissues and, and lead to really interesting adaptable morphologies. Um, but the, the version that I'm, I'm going to mention here is actually much simpler where it's uh, an open loop development. And what we do is we just uh, optimize two structures the one at, at the very first time step and, and what it should end up at the very end. And the way that we, uh, we define growth and development here is just a linear interpolation between the pre-described starting point and ending point. Um, so this is you know, the, the most naive version of a developmental system that, that you could probably think of. Um, and so, so why, why did we do this? What's, what's the idea um, that, that we're going for here? This was inspired by some work from, uh, from Jeff Hinton in, in the 80s um, and was looking at these really hard to find behaviors, these needles in a haystack. Um, and the idea here is that, that these behaviors, you have to get perfect uh, in, in order to, to, to find the reward for them. Um, and so, so they're virtually impossible to find through uh, through any search mechanism, and, and there, there's nothing better than random search in a, in a case like this. Um, but if you introduce some developmental framework, so, so they did this in a completely non-embodied way where they were trying to, uh, to, to look at pattern matching and, and, and symbol matching. Um, and, and what they did is they, they had some fixed signals, but also uh, some of their, uh, their, their symbols were able to randomly uh, change and, and, and uh, uh, and, and develop or grow uh, to, to scan through a, a bunch of possible options um, throughout their lifetimes. And whenever they happen to, to get a match to this needle in the haystack through that random, uh, random processes, uh, they would get a, a tiny bit of reward. So if, if you uh, scan over it really quickly, you get a, a, just a, a very incremental bit of reward. And it turns out that an evolutionary system linked up to this um, I'll take that distribution of, of random guessing and, and compress the window around it such that you're more and more likely to have these random patterns occur, uh, to, to have these random pat patterns cross over um, this single highly performing behavior um, until you've compressed that window so narrowly that now you have uh, a distribution that's a, a static pattern. And, and what you've done is you've found the solution um, to this needle in a haystack. Um, by using some developmental process and then canalizing it down into a single static behavior, which, which would be you know, impossible to find just with the evolutionary loop by itself. So we uh, apply this same idea to robotics um, and uh, uh, give away the, the punchline already. It turns out that uh, incorporating the evolution of development does much better. Um, there, there's some initial cost in, uh, in uh, having to do this, this sweeping through lots of different morphologies. And since you don't have a, a fixed behavior or, or a fixed body plan, it's hard to find good behaviors. Um, but it turns out it, it lets us find this, you know, unique needle in a haystack that, that uh, skyrockets fitness um, as we go. Um, and this is really counterintuitive to the, the developmental window idea that um, even though more development is better than no development, it turns out that the, the highest performing um, the highest performing robots end up having very little development at the end. Um, and it, it's the, the very idea that, uh, that if we look at the evolutionary histories of these high performing robots, um, it turns out that, um, that, that these patterns emerge. Um, I can zoom in on one just to, to draw your attention to it, where you start out with um, this, this really uh, high level of development, a, a really wide developmental window that scans over all of these patterns, and then over time canalizes that into some fixed behavior. And so we're, we're able to find the, this really unique needle in a haystack robotic behavior. Um, what's what's a, a fun anecdote that, that I haven't seen before in the literature is uh, actually, it, it doesn't turn out that the, the starting point for most of these runs is a, a really wide window of a lot of plasticity and, and exploration. Uh, but we, we start out at a, a fairly low level of that, and, and somehow the evolutionary system learns to explore and to increase the window and, and test out more body plans before it finds out that the one that it needs is in the window when it starts narrowing down and, and canalizing back on it. Um, which is a, a, a really interesting 
uh, interaction of, of development and evolution that, that I, I hadn't seen before. So the, the question, of course, is what's the interesting behavior that, that we found? Uh, we've taken our, our jello cube and it's learned how to crawl and walk a little bit. Um, but then, then this funny thing happens where it's realized that at the, at the end of its lifetime, it can fall over and, and, and gain a lot of speed and, and distance right at the very end. Um, and it turns out that, uh, that if you take that idea of, of falling over and that that's a really fast way of, of locomoting, and you narrow in on that window of, of falling over, um, it uh, is a good way to find uh, these creatures that, that end up tipping over not just once, but, but two or three times and, and start to begin to roll. And rolling, it turns out, is, is much, much faster than, than trying to walk. Um, and, and through this, this, uh, this idea of narrowing the developmental window, spending more time in your, in your idealized behavior or, or with your idealized pattern, um, we, what we get is, is creatures that are rolling the, the entire way through. Um, and so, so this, this rolling behavior turns out to be a, a needle in the haystack and, and really hard to find by itself, but with this uh, extra time scale of, uh, of development uh, is, is something that's very consistently found across the runs. Um, and, and there's also another implication um, that there wasn't in, in Hinton and Nolan um, that comes directly from this being an embodied process where you have all of the challenges of, of embodied intelligence, like uh, the, the sequential nature of, of inputs coming in and the fact that your current actions determine the, the next stimuli that you see, which is that falling over can be a bad thing sometimes. If you, you know, nosedive at the very beginning or in the middle of, of these trials, uh, that robot loses a lot of um, loses a, a, a lot of fitness and, and ability to move because it's just squirming around on the ground instead of walking for the rest of the time. And so, because of this sequential linked nature, what ends up happening in, in virtually all of our uh, successful robots is that they've they've learned this falling behavior just at the very end, where there's very low risk of it interfering with walking when you fall over. And, and where, where diving is a great way to cheat a little bit and get a little bit of extra fitness. And, and over evolutionary time, through the, the shaping of this developmental process, that falling has gone from some, something that just occurs at the end to stretching earlier and earlier in time, um, which is it's not something that, that you would think of in a, a non-embodied pattern matching, where, where you could find that optimal behavior at, at any point across your, your lifetime. Um, so just a, another little tidbit of, of how embodied intelligence plays into, uh, in, into these processes. Uh, so uh, just to, to wrap up here, um, the, the ability uh, it, to find interesting phenomenon and solutions relies on adaptability across multiple time scales. And, and thinking about these interactions is, is really interesting and, and I think necessary to find um, really adaptable and robust and, and scalable solutions. So in the, the last two minutes before I, I wrap up here, um, let me just tease that, that I've talked a lot about, uh, you know, Jello robots and, and simulated uh, soft robots here. But I, I hope that these ideas extend beyond just the, the particular instantiation that, that I've talked about. Um, where we can think all the time of, you know, having to place sensors or actuators within some robotic system. and you know, it's, it's really clear that the, pol the optimal policy you would find would depend on what sensory information it has. And what sensory information is, is best depends on what your policy needs or is looking for. And so we, we have these, these uh, you know, tight, fragile couplings um, within um, designing uh, sensors and actuators across a, a wide variety of, of embodied robotic problems um, or, or embodied sensing outside of robotics. Uh, we, I've, I've talked a lot about uh, evolutionary methods and, uh, you know, like all great things in AI, Schmidt Huber did it first. Um, and, and actually his early meta learning work uh, used these evolutionary systems, but, uh, you know, we, we have more modern frameworks that look at passing gradients through different time scales. Um, and, and the mammal system that I love, um, you know, uses two time scales to, um, to pass gradients back and forth and, and find optimal behaviors across many tasks. And, and we've taken this idea um, and, and added in a, a third dimension, um, looking at uh, sequential um, 
sequential uh, uh, inputs for catastrophic forgetting, where, where you have uh, you know, learning that's happening over all of these unique instances, but we've added a, a meta loop on top of that that's, that's learning how to learn within each of these lifetimes. Um, and it turns out to be you know, really, uh, really effective, this three time scale model. Um, thinking in the robotic space about uh, these differentiable systems, I think there's going to be much more emphasis, in, in, including some interesting work um, at, at UVM about um, looking at uh, differentiable physics engines and, and how we can use some of the more modern tools in, in developing um, robotic systems using these ideas as well. And, and finally, the last one that I'm, I'm personally really excited about is that the, the coupling of a robotic structure and its controller, I think, is just such a natural match to the topology and structure of a, of a network, especially a neural network with its control parameters. And I, I think that there's a, an obvious fit of you know, evolutionary approaches to neural architecture search, uh, incorporating some of the ideas here, but, but uh, taking a step back and thinking of more of the abstract lessons learned about um, the, the tight coupling of, of structure and control and the multiple time scales, I think also applies really nicely to you know, weight sharing models that, that use super graphs or even the reinforcement learning based approaches to neural architecture search. So this is a really active area for me and, and something I, I'm uh, really fascinated and intrigued by. Um, so hopefully uh, in, in two minutes, I've convinced you that, uh, that, that these ideas aren't just narrow to, to what we, you've, you've seen so far, but, but extend to uh, lots of, of areas of optimization generally and, and machine learning. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up by, by saying that uh, I, this work has been done with a, a fantastic set of, of collaborators. Um, at, at UVM, Sam Kriegman is a PhD student who's done lots of this work and is going on the job market soon. So uh, re reach out to him. Uh, Josh Bogar has, has been fantastic in really adopting this soft robotic system to, to, to be his own and uh, is, is one of the, the greatest champions and, and such a good person to work with. And, and many others who are fantastic in this field, Julia Lasky, you know, Steve Strogatz, Hod Lipson, Jeff Kloon, I, I could talk uh, for, for quite a while. And, and thanks for the funders for funding this work before it was cool. Um, and, and thanks to you for your attention. Um, I, I realize we uh, haven't got quite so much time for questions, but I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes or uh, better yet, you can reach me uh, via email for a, a longer conversation as well. So thanks. Thank you so much, Nick. This was uh, such an interesting and amazing work. Um, I really personally enjoyed uh, listening to this and watching these amazing robots and how uh, evolution and embodied AI meet uh, in one place. Uh, do we have any question from the audience? And Nick, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so it turns out a lot of uh, your work has been like evolving the body of the robots. Have you considered like incorporating like environmental factors uh, into this evolutionary process? For example, if I have a body app and if I'm crouching on a plain ground versus a ground with a lot of rocks, well, you know, how, what would be the best way to incorporate all these environmental factors into the evolutionary process? And also, is there any way that we can make this faster, like in terms of if I change my body into one environment to the other room, uh, from one environment to the other environment, what will change um, to make this process faster? Yeah, both both great questions. Um, so, in, in terms of uh, additional information, um, I've to you know totally skipped over the the closed loop sensory dependent uh, developmental processes, which I, I think can uh, lead to uh, you know more intelligent context aware behaviors. Uh, the that actually gradient-based work and, and learning to continually learn, um, you know, very explicitly takes into the, these contexts um, that, you know, I think a really interesting way. Uh, but there's, there's a really strong precedent in, in biology for that too, that you see um, even in the earliest stages, those pictures of embryogenesis that, that I'd flashed up uh, motivating the, the compositional pattern producing networks that you know, different, different types of animals, I'm thinking about a moth in particular, though I don't remember its exact name, um, has a different phenotype and, and looks totally different whether it's born in, uh, in the, the spring or in the fall. And that happens from the very beginning in, in terms of, of how it's, it's grown and developed in, in the embryo. Um, and, and I think that that's such a, an interesting process and an idea that there's sensory dependent behavior 
in the, the very growth and design of, of these structures. Um, and, and such a, a, a ample uh, area for, for work that I think would be really exciting. Uh, to, to quickly answer the, the second half of that question, um, I, I think that uh, we've, at least what I've mentioned here is, has done very little at, um, at explicitly accounting for those differences. And even the, the case where I showed, you know, uh, aquatic creatures going on land uh, was, was really more for fun than, than for trying to actually optimize towards these transitions. And thinking of this as, you know, any machine learning system that if you want to be able to transition uh, quickly and effectively across lots of different environments, you have to have training data that shows and, and is designed for um, lots of different transitions. And um, that's something we could, we could certainly do is, is have that be a, a part of the fitness function. And, and, and there's, there's some existing work that's done now with a, a limited number of environments. Um, but, but certainly, uh, I think adaptability would improve greatly if you explicitly optimize for adaptability across all of these, these different, uh, different uh, instantiations and environments. And, and that would lead to systems that are much more adaptable and scalable than the, the kind of naive stuff I've showed here. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for the amazing talk. Thanks. I think Ian has, uh, has another question, and I think that will be our last question of the day. Thanks. Uh, how fast is Logscad when you're talking about supercomputers? Uh, you know, how long does it take to run a generation? And then follow on. Have you, would any of your work translate into a system like Rax? Yeah, good question. Um, so again, all of the work I've shown here is it's pretty old stuff. And uh, a lot of this was embarrassingly slow. Um, there are, are new systems that, that our students use now that are uh, highly parallelized and, and GPU enabled um, that, that work uh, a lot better. Um, this is, is still something, the, the design of morphologies that, that will never be a real time thing. Um, but uh, but it's, it's uh, much faster now. Um, and, and as long as you're you know, not concerned about doing this on a robot in real time, it's, uh, it's actually not too bad. Okay then, thank you. Okay, cool. Thank you so much uh, for the talk and answering all the questions and thank you everyone uh, for joining. Uh, let's be in touch, Nick. Bye. Thanks so much for having me.